This is the Trout Bitten Podcast. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten? Yeah. Trout Bitten. Trout Bitten. It's about trout. Wild trout. This is Trout Bitten. So this is the Trout Bitten Podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Dominic Swintoski, owner of Trout Bitten and author of TroutBitten.com. Since 2014, I've published over 700 articles on the website. There are stories, commentaries, tips, and tactics that run deep. So all of those articles, but this is the first podcast episode, and I'm excited about it. I brought in four of my closest fishing friends to have a conversation, and I'll introduce them in a moment. But first, a little bit about this podcast. Uh, We planned for a full season. How many is that? I don't know, 10, 12, if I had to put a number on it. Expect them about every other week, and we'll see where it goes. We'll have topics like how to handle a trout, stocked versus wild trout, club fishing, the merits or demerits of that. Uh, finding new water, blue lining, stream etiquette. We'll also get deep into the tactics side with the mono rig, tight line, and you're a nymphing. We'll talk about streamers, dry flies, night fishing, fishing with kids, and a lot of the other stuff that I write about on the website. Uh, today, we're going to sort of introduce everyone by talking about how they connect with trout bitten or the trout bitten culture. Uh, I'd like to dig into the character of Troutbitten, the ideals or that driving spirit that sort of defines what Troutbitten is. So Troutbitten receives one and a half million views a year now with 40,000 unique viewers every month. That's well beyond the distribution of most fly fishing magazines. And I'm proud of that. Uh, I bring that up because people connect with the writing. They like the photography. They like the stories. And they like the way it's presented, I think. But what do I mean? I like to think that there's an authenticity, a depth that people can recognize and relate to. And again, it's that spirit of what Trout Bitten really is. Honestly, there are just a lot of other anglers out there who feel the the same way that we do about fly fishing for trout. So let me introduce my friends. Uh, First, here's Trevor Smith. He's a family doctor dad of three, and just the kind of friend who really would give you the shirt off his back. He's probably done it. Trevor is one of the most thoughtful anglers uh, I've ever met. And I don't just mean that he won't front end you very much when you're on the water either. (laughs) I mean, yeah, that's right. He's a true student of the river and an endless seeker of knowledge, uh, as all of us really are here, I think. Say hi, Trevor. Hey, how we doing? Pretty good, bud. Pretty Good. good. It's good to be on here. Trevor, what's your favorite time of the day to fish? My favorite time of the day to fish is bright and early morning before the light. I like to be standing in the water when it's still dark, and I like to start casting the minute I can get a sense for what my drift's going to look like. I like sometimes it. I even try it out before I can see it and just see what it feels like. I like it. So I know you do a lot of night fishing. That's what I thought you were going to say. Yeah, We've done no, some night to- fishing together. Took a curveball um, there. Did you ever take from, you ever go from the morning? Mm. Uh, or I mean like early, early morning, like three o'clock mm. and then go into the dawn? I, th- I think 4.30 is about the earliest I've gotten out in the morning yeah. and just stood there and kind of just absorbed the, the environment a little bit before I started fishing. I used to do that when I'd fish some of my, my favorite sections of more populated streams just to make sure I got there before anyone. So I figured two hours before everybody was, was good enough. That's fun. Yeah. All right. So here's Bill Dell. Bill probably fishes harder than anyone else that I know. He's been through all the phases. Uh, What do they say? Um, First, you want to catch a fish. Then you want to catch a bunch of fish. Then you want to catch a catch the biggest or the toughest fish. Then you want to just catch a fish again, right? So Bill's been through all of those phases a bunch of times already. (laughs) And with with all that time on the water, he's a complete angler. Uh, top to bottom, fast, slow, any water type, Bill can probably pull a trout or two if you, if you give him a minute. Uh, he also guides part-time for trout bitten now. Say hi, Bill. Hi, Don. 
Hey, <laughs> buddy. Uh, Bill, what's your best streamer retrieve? Uh, depends on the day. Yeah. Uh, right now, uh, just kind of throw it out and a uh, little slow swing at the end with a uh, little movement this time of year when it's summer. Uh, make it easy for the fish to eat it. I remember hearing you say that too. Bill, when, when you and I guided um, a couple people, and I was over, I was just overhearing you talk to one of the one of the one of the guys, and that's exactly what you said. Make it make it easy for them. Don't you know? Because most people want to strip, strip, strip fast. And I remember you saying that. That always stuck with me. Um, so here's Austin Dando. I met Austin when he was the president of the Penn State Fly Fishing Club many years ago. Now, when talking to some advisors to the program, I heard about Austin. They said that this young kid came in and laid down a few ground rules about no egos. <laughs> and then he guided the club from there. Um, Austin is a skilled fisherman, but he's also the kind of guy that will build a fire and brew streamside coffee on an island right in the middle of a good streamer bite. Uh, we called Austin Young Love for a while, and that kind of captured his passion and enthusiasm for things. I will also say... I had never met a 20-something-year-old kid who had that much of his life put together and was that mature. So uh, Austin also guides part-time for Trout Bin. Say hi, bud. Hey, happy to be here. Good. Excited for this. <laughs> That's good. Me too. I was going to say something about the sump pump. Oh, the sump pump isn't with us tonight. We did a practice run last week, <laughs> and it was raining hard, and I'm in my basement, and the sump pump was running, and it became its own guest. So mm -hmm. we are without the sump pump. So, uh, uh, Austin, how long is your nymphing leader? Uh, my nymphing leader is about 30 feet uh, from the butt section to the, the point fly. Um, I right. like to go, you know, I started, you know, 22 feet, and then I have a tendency to cast too far and ended up being able to utilize that little extra space. And mm. if I can keep that extra six feet off the reel, um, I'll do it to keep the fly line, even if it's just, you know, dangling by my waist a little bit. Gotcha. All right, so here's Josh Jarling, which just sounds like a cool name. It's much better than Swentoski. Josh Darling. So <laughs> it's true. So Josh is the audio video talent behind Troutbit. Uh, he's done most of the graphic and logo designs for the stuff in the Troutbit and shop, uh, like the tees, hats, stickers, and leaders. Um, he just has an amazing eye with his photography, and I love the artful way that he sees things. He's a fisherman first. So Josh just kind of shows the woods and the water how I see it when I close my eyes. Seriously. Josh Jones, uh, Wilds Media, and it's been fun to watch his business grow over the years. Uh, it's a privilege to have been a small part of that. And uh, Josh is also a dad of two with a third on, on the way. So damn, Josh, you're busy. That's right. Say hi, bud. <laughs> What's going on, guys? Yeah, Happy to be to have here. You here. Yep. Uh, hey, Josh, what's the best part about winter fishing? Solitude. There you go. Yeah. Anything else? What's the second best part? I think that the first two go hand in hand. It's, it's the quiet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good call. It has very little to do with the fishing. Yeah. And the fishing can be great. Fishing can be awesome. Yeah. I will say, like right now, we got to get up early. You know, we mm -hmm. got, I took Joey yeah. out, my oldest son out. Uh this morning and so we got up at five we were out of the house by five thirty. he did not want to get up that's the struggle with summer yeah but and so i take my boys in the off season when i'm not guiding and so that's now and that's going to be after christmas from christmas to about mid-march and that those winter months it's easier to get the boys out now that they're a little bit older they can get the clothes that they can stay warmer i can take them out but it's easier to get them out because you can have good fishing all day in the winter yeah, long days yeah yeah I like that. That's one of my favorite things about winter too. All right, guys. So thanks so much for being here. This will be a lot of fun. Um, let's dig into this. Uh, let's go over a few of the principal, principles or tenets that uh, kind of define the character or, or, or the spirit of trout bitten. Let's talk about them together. So this first one is special to me because this is where it all started. Uh, trout bitten began as a group of friends on a private message board. Uh, my friend Sloop, John Burgess and I set up a private forum for about eight or 10 of us, um, like-minded friends. We were into fishing, exploring, and sharing tactics. 
Sloop titled the board Trout Bitten after a line in a Joe Humphreys book where he says he was a trout bitten kid. And the very first thing I ever wrote on that forum is something that has sort of become a guiding light for what trout bitten is. And I've kept this paragraph ever since. I've brought it over into each version of the website. Um, so I'll read it and then maybe let's talk about it. Um, this is trout bitten. We are passionate and ambitious anglers committed to fishing because we love it, because it awakens our lives in a way that nothing else ever has, and because fishing is sometimes hard and sometimes it's easy. In truth, we fish because we have to, because without cold water flowing around us for some time, our spirit dries up a bit. And while standing in a river facing upstream, the water moves through and restores us. It fills us. It mends us. And then it washes away all of those things that just need to be washed away once in a while. Because working around a stream bend to which we've delivered a thousand casts a dozen times before forges a connection with our own past, creating vivid recall of partners who've shared the same water, which no photograph will ever reproduce. Because we have memories deeper and richer with more emotion when our hands are wet and our legs are weak from hours spent hiking a water-filled path against the current. Our best friends are all fishermen. This is trout bit. So that's it. I mean, that's it, guys. To me, that 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 starts it. That's what started it all, and it's just stuck around. Yeah, I like it because I think you know, in our own ways, we all kind of found each other over those common principles, and I don't think that it would have been easy to put into words exactly how you did. But you know, hearing that read out loud, there's just so many aspects to that 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 certainly I identify with, um, and that have led me to you know, the lifestyle I have now where fishing is very much a part of it and a very conscious choice. And, you know, it's a sacrifice, you know, when you're a dad of three and you got a busy job and, and yet, as you mentioned, you know, it doesn't feel like a choice. It feels like a joy and an, an opportunity and, and the sacrifice makes it all the sweeter. Yeah. It's like, it's like something that you just have to do. I remember mm -hmm. the longest time I ever went without fishing was when my first son was born, when Joey was born. And I think it was six weeks. And I remember my wife saying, you know, a couple of weeks in, like, hey, you can go fishing. I said, no, nah, I'm not going to go until I can actually start fishing again. You know, not just to go once, but to get back out there. Something, it's just something we have to do. Like Austin, I know you didn't fish for a while here, right? You just bought a new house. You got a thousand things that you, you want to do with the house before you move in. Right. It's a weird feeling, but the description you just gave of, you know, needing to be there and how it washes away the stuff that needs to be washed away. I could definitely feel the difference between not fishing for a certain length of time versus, you know, fishing regularly. Mm. And it's a mm. good way to yeah. or take that for granted. And that if you are lucky enough to end up in a trout stream, you know, more than once in a while, that's a pretty special thing to have in life. And a lot of people yeah. don't get to have that. Man, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. There's a huge difference between being out there even once a week or being out there once a month. Yep. I think you can even like more recently pull the last two years of context to mind of you just going through a time of difficulty for the country and all the kind of interpersonal strain that has come along with this time. Mm -hmm. I think for those that maybe didn't feel it as acutely, boy. What a time to just recognize that need to be out there, need to, to clear your mind and sort of connect over a common purpose and one that hasn't changed. You mentioned those memories made and man, yeah, thank God for the, the memories we have on the stream and all the good memories over the past two years. And it wasn't, a, and, and it wasn't affected, um, mm -hmm. you know, fishing by itself, the fishing by itself is socially distancing. Dude, that's true. Yeah. And so, you know, when I go fishing, my goal is not to, to see 10 other people. It's to be on the water and not see anybody that day, unless mm -hmm. it's somebody I chose to spend a day on the river with. But that's what drives a lot of where I fish and how mm -hmm. I fish is to just avoid people mm -hmm. and to just, you know, spend time, you know, you versus the fish. Mm -hmm. Work that out. Good stuff, Bill. Yeah. And the other thing, the last thing I'd say about that is like, well, our best, my best friends are all fishermen. I mean, they really are. 
through the years and even the relationships that I have with my, my kids have grown stronger the more I get to fish with, you know, and my dad and my uncle. And that's it. I mean, you guys, other friends in my life, really, my best friends are all fishermen. Um, so let's get, here's the next one. Here's the next one. So I end every article with fish hard. Um, that's how much it's ingrained into trout pit. Uh, to me, fish hard means to get after it, uh, get out there with a purpose and get something done. Don't hope, but fish like fish hard. Like I, I, I think that's what drives us and keeps us in the game for a lifetime. Like just being out there only lasts so long and that novelty wears off. You know, it's nice just being out there. No, it's not. Not for very long. I mean, there's only one thing that's, that's true. There's only one thing that's going to put your boots in the water, you know, day after day or even month after month. It's catching fish. That's right. It, it, so it's, it's having that purpose. That's what I mean by fishing hard. It's working on something and improving or searching. Um, that gets, I think, all of us out there day after day and, and trip after trip. Yeah. And that purpose can always be changing. You know, you talked about Bill when you were introducing him, how he's gone through that rotation of, I want to catch numbers. So I just, I just want to enjoy being out there. I want to hone my skill. I want to catch big fish now. It's always rotating. I, I think it, I, it almost rotates for me. Like it can rotate daily, hourly. Like there are days when I'm just like, I, there are days that I'm just happy to be on the water. And there are days that, you know, I have a purpose and I, you know, Hey, I want to catch. 40 fish today. I want to catch 20 fish today. You know, there's other days where it's like, well, let me see if I can catch them on dry fly yeah. today. But it's, it's a great sp sport in that you have the opportunity to do all of that. There's no, I wouldn't say there's not a wrong way to do it, but you know, there's opportunities to enjoy it in many different yeah. ways. And I think there's an intentionality to the way that we all fish that, that I appreciate, you know, it's kind of like you mentioned, you're not waiting for the fish to come to the tactic that you've decided to pick that day necessarily, but you're continually modifying, continually absorbing the information that the water, that the bugs, that the trout are giving you. And you use that to turn that around and, and catch more fish or catch a bigger fish. Yep. That's a lot of fun. I feel like with a fly rod in hand, you can meet the trout on their terms. I write that. I say that a lot. To me, that's why I fly fish. Because you can do anything with that rod and, a, and a, you know, a bunch of fly boxes and a couple liters. And some bobbers. Don't forget and a bobbers. couple bobbers. Yeah, you know, whatever it takes. Yeah, Dom, when I hear, uh, you know, the term, you know, fishing hard, I, I think back to a time when I lived in North Carolina after school for a couple of years. And where I lived, I often had to travel, you know, kind of far to get to good trout water. And... Going back on what Trevor said a little bit about the intentionality of the of the fishing, having to travel created more intentionality for me because you know all the trips were planned, um, caused me to search the maps even harder. You know, choose the accesses that um, weren't necessarily easy to get to on foot. Uh, there was one particular river that I used to fish that was really hard to access on foot. Most guys fished it out of a boat, and you couldn't get to most of it through uh, you know your own manpower. And I took that as a challenge of, you know, I'm going to find the ways, I'm going to scour the maps, I'm going to figure out how to get into some of these hard to reach places that the fish aren't being you know, targeted as much at on foot. And for me, that meant you know, finding some power lines and hiking the power cut up over the mountain and back down the other side and spending all day in a river that really does not have a very high density of trout. But that was my drive to fish hard all day. And it kind of became my standard that you know, if you're not fishing hard the whole time, those few trout that you do come up upon, if, you're not, if you don't have your act together during it, they're just going to pass you by and you're never going to know that you were there. So it really forced me to stay in a, I don't know, a tough mental state almost the whole time of, you know, I have to believe there's fish here. I can't just start getting sloppy. I have to fish hard. And you know, there's one particular instance where all that came together and I caught a really great fish. And I actually remember sending you the text message afterwards and you're like, heck yeah, man, that's, that's trout pin. That's, that's what fishing hard is. Um, you know, it's yeah. Staying the whole way through and believing what you're doing is, is the right thing. Um, not just out there telling yourself, 
this is how something's supposed to work, but, you know, having an actual tangible result in your hands at the end of it. Mm -hmm. Or, or pulled over to a river in the spot and, you know, hopped out and, you know, took 10 steps and got in the river and stood there all day. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, yeah. If you're, if you're, <laughs> you're into you, that. <laughs> I will say too, right? These guys have kids. When you have when yeah. you when you have a couple kids, sometimes all you have is that hour hour That's and right. a half to get out. So I hop right over to guardrail and start fishing, whatever it takes. Josh, Josh knows I show up to pick him up sometimes in my waders because I know that la that that's five, right. ten minutes. You don't want to waste that time. Yeah, there you go. I don't want to waste that time. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Trevor's yeah. the guy who shows up with or you know what, always showing up with his waders on, or I'll pick him up. It's, he's got his waders on. First, I thought it was because it was just winter because that's when we first, if I think first started fishing together i was like oh yeah he's one of those guys that does that in the winter no oh man does it all the I'm, time i might catch that good fish on that last cast and i want to have 10 more last casts i think you're just so excited about the trip you probably put your waders on like two hours beforehand <laughs> <laughs> so i used to i used to do into it used to do that in high school like we'd get ready to go fishing and i'd put my waders on and we'd drive an hour and a half in a hot truck <laughs> yeah yeah you know that was back in the neoprene days and didn't feel Ooh. so good Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, nope. No. Or you can be like me and you get in the truck in your waders and you drive an hour and a half there and you leave your boots at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> nice. Never left anything. I, I I remember the first time uh you know, lining up a time to fish with Trevor. I think I texted Dom and said something about like, you know, hi, you know, what's what's it like to fish with Trevor? And he's like, He comes prepared, he's got his waders on. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and I said, Okay, I got I'll bring my A game. <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> he didn't mean fit, you know, skill wise. He just he just meant my waders were on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Ready. All right. So that's fishing hard. Let's let's move on. Let's move on to another trout pitting tenant. I guess. Uh, I think what kind of dovetails along with the fish hard mantra is trout pitting's tendency or lean toward advanced tactics. I mean, from the beginning, way back in 2014. I decided I did not want to write fly fishing 101 stuff. Um, even back then, there was plenty of it online. And now there are so many sites that have that kind of beginner level article. I mean, that's great. There's, it's needed. Nothing wrong with that. And, uh, but it's really not my role as I see it. It's not Trout Bitten's role as I see it. But honestly, the format of Trout Bitten and having written for so long now, allows me to flesh out these topics in like a series style fashion that you can read one article after the other on the, on, on the website. I mean, there's a book's worth of material already on night fishing. There's a small book's worth of stuff on dry dropper alone. There are, there are a couple hundred articles on the mono rig and tight lining. So the basics were really covered a long time ago. And there's so much more for me to learn and write. And I think a lot of the stuff that I, you know, stuff that you've written has made me think about my own fishing experiences. Uh, when I first started nymphing, I was chuck and duck. I liked that tick, tick, tick on the bottom. And so some of your articles about, you know, riding in the middle of the seam and, you know, not, you don't have to be on the bottom. You just have to be in the zone. I think that's, that's made me a better fisherman just interacting and bouncing those ideas back and forth because, you know, when I first started, I was like, I got to be on the bottom, you know, that's where the fish are, but that's not always the case. True. I mean, and then like we were talking about, even before we started recording this today, I was on the bottom and I was enjoying it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and there, it's, everything works, you know, once in a while. Yeah. I think the more specific you can get about the tactics you're using too, you can, start to make deductions about what's really working and what isn't. And that's something I've always appreciated about the way you fish is that you, you do things so intentionally that when the fish aren't responding to it, you, you already know what you can change because you've made the decision to fish the way you are for a reason in, in the first place. And it certainly is something that I don't know. I, I do think that it's unique. Um, you know, and it's a different type of fly fisherman that that really thinks that critically about what they're doing. Yeah, we're all like that. And I think that's why we all here connect. And I, I'm sure that a lot of people listening are the same way, you know, and it's like oh, a willingness or a need to move on past that 
intro stuff. One of my things is like the industry underestimates the average angler so often. It's kind of annoying, to be honest. Um, with you know, with gear, with tactics and articles that are and videos that are given to them, it's it it, it becomes very repetitive. So like we can move on past a lot of that now in this information age. Um, Got that's it. how I feel yeah. about it. Yeah, I think before we went night fishing last, you sent me an article. It was like the eight reasons you need to night fish. And, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. <laughs> it was it was hilarious. <laughs> there was it that's a it. joke, right? Yeah, it was right. a joke, and it was some pretty. It was poorly written. Um, well, but honestly, though, if you were just starting, that'd be a good article, right? But I'm saying <laughs> yeah. a lot of us, you know, we're yeah. we're not we're past that stage. Yeah, and, and yeah. I think I think the friendship we all have, we kind of push each other. Like we don't take crap. Like, hey, I was doing this. Well, why and why'd you do that? And you know, we 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 question each other as much as we question ourselves to kind of I don't know level set. You know, no egos allowed from mm -hmm. the Austin perspective. <laughs> right. But yeah. uh, that's right. And with Josh and I, like when we night fish, we've taken that so much to heart that we actually got walkie talkies to use at night because yeah. we missed yeah. that aspect of feedback from each other. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you put two sets of data points together and all of a sudden you're learning twice as much as you could otherwise by yourself. That's and right. so when we fish together, we're not always in proximity to speak easily, but we're constantly talking back and forth about what kind of retrieve, where was the fish, you know, what kind of strike, what fly, everything. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and it really helped, has helped tremendously. Sure. That is a special kind of fishing, buddy. They're hard to find. And there's, there's five of us here that all kind of feel the same way about each other. There's literally no egos, no competition with each, with, uh, between each yeah. other. And when you can share that kind of stuff, I don't know, that is special. The the competition thing is is big. I fished with some people that want to outfish you. I'm like, okay, cool, go ahead. I'm just I I I think um, fishing with Trevor. I think Trevor's more excited for someone else to catch a fish than him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a great thing. Agreed. To, somebody to fish with. And when Austin finally catches a fish, everybody's just really excited for. <laughs> yeah. <him. laughs> I'm just Guys. I'm just kidding. Buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, uh, it, the advanced tactics thing. It's fun to look back over the years and see what you once considered to be advanced mm -hmm. versus what you believe now to be. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. You yeah. know, like when I first met Sloop, he mentioned sort of at the beginning, um, I started fishing with Sloop seven years ago now. And yeah. That was the first time I ever saw a version of a mono rig. At that time, he took some Maxima chameleon out of the back of his overly stuffed vest and tied yeah. on like, <laughs> five feet of it and i didn't even know what it was it's like what is this substrate and then he tied on a leader and he gave me an idea <laughs> of of how to drift it and i thought man this is this is kind of heady and then i just kept working on it kept working on it and it was struggled for a long time you know like all of us do and then uh you know now that's as as purely basic as it could be to me yeah it's fun to look back <laughs> remember fishing, fishing with Grobe, and I was like, "What are you spin fishing, buddy?" Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> oh, that mono rig stuff—that's just yeah. spin fishing. Yeah. yeah, spin fishing. That was a funny day because such a it was a I don't know end of July day, and the water was low. And then he was just trying to convince me, like, "I promise you, this catches fish." You know, just because I'm not catching anything in the day, you know, mm -hmm. I, I promise <laughs> you, this <laughs> this works. Yeah, he just right. you know he wanted to instill in me that the tactic he was showing was was you know not just bs and uh, right at the end of the day he did he did follow through that's good yeah it's just an, a drive to continue to you know find you know uh, better tactics or refine them that's all. yeah all right let's take a break here and we'll get right back to it fulling mill is the world's leading producer of flies fly boxes hooks beads and tippet Known for their barbless hooks, they have many of your favorite trout patterns tied barbless. Not only that, they feature patterns from anglers like George Daniel, Pat Weiss, Josh Miller, Joe Goodspeed, and many others from around the world. Every pattern is backed by the 200% fulling mill guarantee. If a fly isn't up to the highest standards that you expect, they will replace it with two that are. Stock up at FullingMill.com or ask for their flies at your local dealer. So Austin and I used to joke around about this one a lot. 
sitting around over a beer down at Bar Blue one night, I think I said, fly fishers all too often are, in fact, a little much. And I uh, later put that into an article, and that quote has come up many times. Um, but, but here's what I mean. I mean, I grew up, I grew up fishing bait. I fished uh, strung minnows on a spinning rod, and I, I still do sometimes. And when I first started really digging into fly fishing, late, late teens, early 20s, I was a bit turned off by the stigma, more than a bit. I mean, I was, I was turned off. And I, I mean, the, the arrogance and the elitist thing, it, it's real. <laughs> I mean, it's for real. And I think that too many fly anglers really take themselves too seriously. And so fly fishermen all too often are, in fact, a little much. Yeah, uh, the the hatch stuff drives me nuts at times. Like, well, there's a Quill Gordon and there's a Hendrickson and there's a Sulfur, and we gotta we have to have 15 different nymphs that have just a shade different tan dubbing on the top, just a shade different brown dubbing on the bottom. I, I to me, it's the ability to present the fly at at a, at a decent drift far outweighs any of that and it doesn't matter if you got a thousand dollar rod or if you got a hundred dollar rod if you can present that and be a quality fisherman doesn't matter the fish don't care yeah i mean i think we all pretty much agree with that is it a quill gordon or a blue uh blue winged olive i mean you know uh, that stuff does matter to an extent obviously nobody here is denying that but uh, yeah, I think we all agree with what Bill said, you know. I think it's a, I mean, a, a lack of humility can be really off-putting in any part of fly fishing. And I, back to the point of us just enjoying fishing with each other and enjoying each other's successes, I think that competition and sort of the need to separate you from everyone else can enter into the fly fishing realm. And because gear is expensive, um, I think that can feed into it too. To where guys are, you know, they gravitate towards that style of fishing because it has expensive gear, it has high class gear, and it, it can, it can sometimes, I think, perpetuate that that attitude. Yeah, I totally agree. It's like uh, Jason from Wait Out There podcast says, fly, fi fly fishing is special, but not elite. It's that elitism that is this big stigma on fly fishing that turns people away. It almost turned me away. To be honest, I mean, I was, you know, I didn't want to be one of those guys. So I never have been. And when people start complaining about oh, the bait fishermen do this and they kill all the fish or they poach all the time, I'm like, well, I never did that. You know, so that's that's not what Troutman's about anyway. Do, is, do you think it has anything to do with the more people that are involved in the fly fishing now is that it's gotten more affordable Dom, I think, you know, we're the, we're the senior members of this group, you know, with the kids around, around right. the, around the right. fire here. Sure. Um, I feel like when we were younger, it seemed like gear, like fly fishing gear was a lot more expensive. And now there's a broader range of kind of price ranges for different gear. And so maybe that's allowing yeah. more people to get into the sport now. That's a good thing though, right? I uh, well, if, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> I think there's to me too, like I was taught to fly fish a little bit by my uncle as a kid. And then also by a couple other older fly fishermen that were probably in their seventies or eighties when they were teaching me. And I, one thing I do distinctly remember is the definitions for them of what fly fishing was were very, very specific, you know, and very rigid. And I think that that's something that I appreciate about the trout bitten's tactics is that they use the fly fishing platform but they're not at all designed to do something for the sake of doing it that's not geared towards catching fish you know like you'll modify and adapt techniques to catch more fish and to be more effective and the reason you've chosen the fly fishing platform is because you truly believe that it's the most effective one to have chosen oh for sure yeah and I think that's a big yeah. difference between just saying like, I'm going to approach the flies with a dry fly rod and dry flies. And if they're not biting, then I won't fish. Yeah. Yeah. There's just a lot of ego 
You know, there's a lot of ego in, in a lot of realms of fly fishing and everybody seems, not everybody, I take that back. So many factions of people though, seem to want to just, hey, I do it this way because it's the best way to do it. And I don't think we're like that. And I think, you know, the people that I relate to the most and that I want to hang out with the most, and I don't know, the things I try to convey to, it's like, it's not like that. You know, it's not dry fly fishing is, is the best, or I'm just a streamer guy and that's all I do, or I'm only a tight line nymph guy or whatever the case may be. Uh, nah, you know, I mean, go ahead. One of my, one of my favorite people is, is just a fantastic, Chris Hazer is, is a fantastic dry fly guy. And we joke around, they'll go, oh yeah, you use those nymphs, but he, you know, there's, there's no pretense about the guy. There is no ego, but he's one of the best dry fly guys that I know. He's extremely dedicated to it. He loves it. And that's how he likes to do it. Fantastic. But in my opinion, he has the, uh, the, the right idea, the right, the right approach to it. Uh, he, he isn't a little much. You know what I mean? Fly fishers are all too often a little much, but he isn't. Yeah. Back, uh, back in school, I used to be part of a blog um, with a couple guys. And one of the things I wrote uh, my first article on that blog, it was Ooh. called Pride Versus Progression. And like you said, Dom, um, the ability to kind of move on to other things or just say, hey, no, I'm closed-minded. This is how it's supposed to go. But the uh, premise of the article, and I still believe it, is that you, know, you can either be I don't know, so firm in your stance that there's no other answer to your uh, questions or you can um, choose to have an open mind and think, yeah, you know, I, I might not know everything there is to know about this. And there's probably a lot of stuff that I don't know. And always remembering that you, know, you don't know what you don't know. And you have to be uh, you know, open to open to others' critiques and, and methods and, and, you know, go find out for yourself. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah for sure. That kind of dovetails in, here in, into the next one. Which is, uh, I mean, so, so another quote that has come up a lot is that everything works sometimes. <laughs> I write that a lot. We say that all the time. And I love it. I mean, that's the, that's the thing about fly fishing, right? How many times have we seen trout do crazy, unpredictable things? And we learn from that. And that's the point, to learn from it. And, and for all the deep dive we do into tactics, advanced tactics, right? All that stuff that we do and we're thinking about. There's always that part in the back of your mind that's reminding you, hey, everything works sometimes. So, you know, you, you'll try crazy things or uh, you, you just don't know what to expect. And you can't, that's sort of the, the beauty of, uh, of the whole thing for, for me is that everything, can, everything works sometimes. No matter what you do, you could probably make it work at some point. Bill, one of your best fish this year, you were dragging a headbanger behind you, weren't you? Yeah, my biggest. Yeah, <laughs> that doesn't count. Yeah. I, I've caught, I've caught a. This weekend, I caught, I caught two different fish. I would say I wasn't even really trying to fish. It was sad. Like I, I was, I was in between like waiting steps, and I just threw the line up and took a couple steps, and then I picked up, and I was like, "Oh, that's a fish!" And both the the one day it was the best fish I caught that day. And it was just literally laying there on the bottom. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and I just spent, I, I don't know. You, you can talk about all the great casts you've made, but there's also those casts that you've made that have just been like, ah, eh, let me throw this here. You know, I'm in between waiting and I have a, I don't know if it's a good tendency or maybe, maybe it is because I seem to catch fish where I'll, I'll throw my, throw my rod out, or throw the line out. And, uh, just let it drag behind me with a streamer when I'm waiting, mm -hmm. and I've caught a couple high teams, trolling. Big, or even big, I'm trolling. Yeah, that's right. Human trolling that's with, right. the, with the legs. That's I can, I can get you some info on that. <laughs> yes. You can write an article. It's a tactic, on it. buddy. That's right. Yep. I <laughs> call those bonus 101. fish. <laughs> you call them what? Bonus fish. Yeah. Those are freebies. Those are freebies. What's special though about this is that we can all admit, yeah. Everything works sometimes, and we say that pretty often, especially mm -hmm. when crazy things happen. But, but mm -hmm. what Trout Bitten has become is this, this extensive database of information to allow for things to work more often. 
you know, I mean, <laughs> that's a good way to put you it. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's like, yeah, yeah. it's taking the chance out of everything works sometimes and, and mm-hmm. slowly stacking the odds in your favor every time you, yep. you a- add another layer of tactics to what you're doing every time you fine tune it just a little bit. So it's like we believe in those advanced tactics, mm-hmm. yeah. And yet, there's always that thing in the back of your mind right, that's right. saying, "Well, there's, pro- there's, you know, something simpler could work, or even something more advanced could work." Yeah. You know? Yep. You're waiting for that next thing to learn. When I fish, it's, it's a constant. Surprise you. Yeah. It's a constant conversation with myself of, should I do this? Mm-hmm. Should I do that? Should I switch? Yeah. Should I throw a streamer? Should I, should I nymph? Should I? Uh, should I should make 10 more casts or should I say, screw this and walk up to the next run and catch a little or fish. Yeah. I'll tell you. I mean, I, I, I've guided people and I have a couple guys that have come back and, uh, one of my buddies now, uh, says like, I get tired of all that. He's talking about what, what you do. He's like, I get tired of like second guessing myself all the time. And he's like, I did, sometimes I just want to, you know, put two flies on and, and go fish. I'm like, yeah, me too. I mean, I get it. I'm sure we all feel like that. Yeah. sometimes i feel yeah. like i need to leave stuff in the car sometimes like uh-huh. if i want it if i if i really want to catch fish put the streamers in the car and stop playing with them and uh just take mm-hmm. some nymph take some nymphs and just dedicate yourself that day to one tactic but yep i think back to josh and austin's points though too like and to what you were saying dom to me what it means to go out now and just in just just fish two flies and just enjoy it that's really different than it did you know, looked like two, three years ago, um, certainly more four or five years ago, but it, the set of things that I, that are sort of just natural to our fishing at this point have already been refined to a point of you're, you're talking a common language in terms of, in terms of rigging, in terms of drift, in terms of some of those basics. And, and I do think that the longer you employ advanced tactics, the more natural they feel. To the point that you are catching more fish every time you're out or you are catching more or it's more it's more part of what you're eating and breathing and and drinking in every single time you're out and it doesn't feel like work it just feels like a natural breathing process that's awesome when that happens you know and and if i don't get into that sort of uh zone you know that that state uh, every time i'm fishing then i feel like I don't want to say I failed, but that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking for is that you just forget about everything else. What you just described to me as being in a zone, you know? Yeah. And that's why fly fishing is such a therapeutic sport. You know, it's Mm -hmm. used as therapy for cancer survivors, for PTSD survivors, because it occupies so much of the mind that it releases you, you know, you're caught up in it. Well, you made a good point too, at the end that, that it's not work, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that's something that dissuades a lot of people from making often changes or changing tactics or switching over to something like a mono rig or, you know, or taking a mono rig off because there's a rise happening there, you know, there's a hatch Mm -hmm. happening and and right. Switching leaders, all that. But when you, when you can realize that's not work, that's just part of fishing and you can learn to enjoy that. Then you can uh, devote yourself to like higher thinking on the water. And then it's just fun. I love it. Yep. I think once, once you've uh, gained confidence in those advanced tactics, um, I think confidence is something that is key in fly fishing. If you can have confidence in what you're doing and to the point, start to stop second guessing yourself. Yeah. I think, I think that goes a long way. I know you talked about sloop, uh, sloop, sloop's always asking for feedback and I'm like, you're doing it right. You know, I think he, he's, he, you know, hopefully Sloop listens to this and, you know, he's the, he's a he's heck a of a lot. show tonight. He is. He's a heck of a better <laughs> fisherman than he thinks he is. You know, he just have confidence. Um, I see that a lot with, you know, some people start to question themselves. I'm like, no, you got it. You know, make those casts and eh, they're not eating today. Move on. Right on. So let's do a couple more of these. We got a couple more left. Um, so not everybody has a trout stream in their backyard. and I do now, but I didn't grow up that way. But I've made life decisions based around access to excellent year-round trout fishing. I still don't get to fish every day, but I do have a life on the water. Uh, But even before trout bitten was my career, I lived a life on the water for a long time. Uh, Meaning 
the river and the the trout and everything that that brings it was part of my daily life and it still is just like you guys um you might not be fishing today but you're listening to this podcast or you're tying flies or you're talking to your buddy at work about weekend fishing plans and that to me is is a life on the water yeah i'm yeah we talked about this a little bit earlier and i think you know trevor you're in the same spot right now dom you're you've kind of you're starting to get out of this spot of young children mm. you know but i'm certainly in a stage right now where i'm not fishing nearly as much as i'd like to and austin you're you're experiencing this also with the new house and everything but yeah but you're right you know we're that's that's what led to more devotion to night fishing you know i wake up to multiple screenshots from trevor often with like the the flows for that week and you know in the summer we're almost every day we're taking our our kids down to the creek and just letting them play around we're showing them stuff we're, we're looking at fish from the bridge we're it's a part of every day yeah right it's neat to see you going through the same things that uh, very similar things that i did yeah um you know when i had two really young kids like yours same thing you're saying i mean i i, I was taking care of them during the day and playing music at night and mm -hmm. i <laughs> i didn't want to i wasn't going to be in the house all day yeah so i took them down to the river and i had them in a baby backpack That's if right. they were that young you know right. and as soon as they could get in the river they were in the river yeah. safely yes all of that but just having them around and it, having around the water but yeah it's living that life on the water that's you you can't be without it i think one of the signs you live a life on the water are the types of gifts people give you when, when <laughs> they know you well just, and that's my, true my buddy cole yeah. taylor gave me one of the best gifts that anyone ever has ever given me and it was a baby backpack and yeah man, i've been taking each of my kids fishing since they were probably six months old and yeah i know it terrifies my wife but uh and man, they've just, some of my sweetest times with them have been out on the water and I've had them just fall asleep there, loving getting to touch the fish and getting sure. to enjoy, enjoy what I love about being out there. I th I thought last year was cool when we, you know, Trevor and I fished and he brought, uh, <laughs> that was Jack, I brought, think. brought yeah. Jack and then, yeah. uh, brought the kids with him. And so. Jack was falling asleep in the backpack and I'm like, yeah. no, you, you fish the next run, you know, you've got a limited time until he wakes up and starts smacking you in the back of the head. So <laughs> you also yeah. noticed he wasn't strapped in properly. So you, I have to think, yeah, you I was like, Hey, he uh, fall out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. If you want to keep three kids, uh, you might want to fix that. <laughs> the other, the other thing is that, uh, you Trevor and, um, and, and Josh, getting into night fishing kind of at the same time you know when my kids were that age those are free hours man those are free hours kids are down you know everybody's fed and tucked into bed and everything's good and everybody's you know everybody else is you're ready to sleep and you go mm, i'm gonna go fishing you know i love it free hours free hours exactly. austin do, <laughs> does this make you excited for future plans austin yeah it's really getting me uh pumped up <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. you either night fish or you stop fishing yeah, yeah. Uh, even like another part of like the life on the water idea is is like i put boot studs in today you know i yeah. what yeah, maintenance. Pair of boots. yeah yeah that's it yeah it's everything about fishing and there's a lot and you guys know what i'm talking about if you don't patch those waders you're gonna be out next time and you're gonna oh man i forgot to you know now i'm really uncomfortable so yeah. you better get home and the next day or that evening, you better patch those waders. And there's just or, maintenance, yeah. Or you donated a half dozen green weenies to a tree and you got to replenish the box. <laughs> That's right. Because you, you suck at casting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's when you're not on the water, you're thinking about being on the water too yeah. as a way to tell. Uh, like this, this afternoon during my lunch break, I remembered I need a new fly line. So I got online and I, I ordered myself a new fly line because... You know, it was burning in the back of my head that I needed to still do that. Yeah. Doesn't stop. Doesn't yep. take breaks, even if, you know, your frequency of fishing is, is variable. Right. So that's a life on the water for sure. All right. So let's do one more of these. For me, this is sort of the capstone on all of this, or the bookend to the paragraph that I read earlier about this is trout bitten. Uh, the fisherman is eternally hopeful. My friend Rich Alsippi told me this a hundred times before he passed away. He left me with a lot of lessons, but 
this might be the biggest one, hope, right? The fisherman is eternally hopeful. I mean, what's the point of making the next cast if you don't have hope? If you do it without hope, what's the point? Um, it's the same thing that great athletes have, always believing that they can and will win the game. Hope is where so much of success in life starts, and I think we can exercise that hope in the way that we fish. Yeah, I, it's interesting that I can't remember your exact words earlier, but but you said something along the lines of like, uh, fish hard, you know, don't don't hope. But then it's different things. It's being in this eternal state of hope, almost hoping in in what you know works. There you, you know? I love that. There you go. You tie it up. There's those two yeah, things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not relying on hope to catch you fish. It's not just right. hoping that anything is going to work. It's it's putting the work in mm -hmm. and then hoping in in the fact that you know, in hoping in the success that's going to come from that. Giving yourself like a new reason to believe yeah, all the time. That's right. You know? But yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. I think if you fish enough, you can find examples of exceptions that you can always have hope. So uh, a few years ago when Austin was getting married, he was living in North Carolina and came up and I was like, Hey, you know, for your bachelor party, let's go fishing. I got a couple spots. We'll hit them. And yeah. wasn't that was your the, wedding morning? It was, uh, no, that was the day before my, oh, okay. I I'm sorry. my yeah, wedding I'm morning, sorry. <laughs> but this was the day before that. And I was like, Hey, you know, come on, I will, we'll hit some spots. I think we <laughs> might catch some fish. And I was like, well, you know, we'll get out really early and hopefully we'll catch a couple fish. And it was the worst conditions you could think of. Yeah. It was, it was like mid nineties. It was bright and sunny. It was, the stream was a little bit on the lower side. It was cold and it was one of the best fishing days I've had in the last five mm. or six years. And it was just like, Hey, let's go. And you know, it was, it was a good time. And yeah, had you not had enough hope to at least go, you would never have experienced it. Right. right. It's like being down six runs in the ninth inning and you go, we can still do it. So let's, let's get out there and give yeah. it a, everything we, we got. got. It. And then it works, you know, somebody clears the bases. I mean, that's, that's what it's about. I really like how you said it's an exercise. Like it's something you can exercise because, hey, man, I still remember back to the very first cast I ever made at night. And I think that was the least hopeful cast I've ever made in my life. <laughs> <As> I, <laughs> And yet, you know, today, now, you know, every cast has much more meaning and hope because I've seen, I've seen success, right? Or I've exercised that hope and had that hope. And, you know, so I think there's this, like that exercising of that hope is then met with the fulfillment of what we're trying to do by catching fish. And each time you match that hope to that fulfillment of it, it, I think, gets a little stronger and you get a little more durable as an angler. Durable. Mm, That's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Nicely put. It's almost like you build a collection, you know? And the more that collection builds, the, the more durable you get. I love it. All right, so thank you, guys. Thanks so much for the conversation. We'll do it again real soon. And thanks to everyone out there who's listening. If you have ideas, questions you'd like to have answered, or topics you'd like to hear covered, get in touch with us. Uh, all right, remember, troutpitten.com is a free resource for all anglers. I hope you'll dig in and check it out. Navigate through the menus and find what you like. Share it, leave a comment, use the search page if you're looking for something specific, and navigate by way of the categories and tags, too. Thanks so much for listening. Please rate the podcast on iTunes, especially, and leave a comment. That helps. Until next time, friends, fish hard, enjoy the day, and find your life on the water. <laughs>